All right, go away week two. It's on to week three. Welcome into Fantasy Football Today DFS. Frank Sample joined as always by Sina Jad and Mike McClure. We're going to deep dive all of the games on the main slate. We'll have our cheat sheet coming up later on in the podcast, which features our favorite stack, chalk plays, value, and of course, one contrarian play from each of us. It's going to be fun. But first, I realized that we missed Thursday Night Football on our last podcast. We're going to do that more normally moving forward. We'll hit Thursday Night Game at the end of the Tuesday podcast, so it gives you uh, more time to plan accordingly. But for anybody who might be listening or watching this before the Thursday Night Football game, Mike, what do we got? Showdown. It's Panthers, Texans, Davis Mills, Christian McCaffrey. What a game. What a game <laughs> indeed. Uh, it's a very interesting spot. So normally the defense is... Uh, I don't use them a lot, and I think I'm very close. I say I think because I still haven't locked everything in yet, but I'm very close to also not using them tonight. I think that there's too much public interest in the defenses here. I think that the Texans team is sneaky enough that if they can avoid the turnover that leads to an actual defensive touchdown, I think that the defenses will end up being over-owned. So I'm very excited about that. Very, very, very excited about that. It'll either be a really good night for me or a really bad night for me, but that's kind of what you're in for when you play showdown sites. Um, quickly going to give you a rundown of my captain exposure on DraftKings. I've got Christian McCaffrey, 38%. Uh, I think that's going to be slightly overweight to the field or about even. I'm projecting about 35%. And then Sam Darnold, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, all equal at 14%. Brandon Cooks, 9%. Davis Mills, 7%. And then my remaining 4% is divided up between the two kickers, uh, Zane Gonzalez and Joey Sly. I think there are scenarios, because of the pricing the way it is, that we could be looking at a Zane Gonzalez kicker lineup getting there tonight. Should they fall short, not have huge ceiling games, should they kick three field goals, um, I think that there are scenarios that could be a winning combination on the slate. Very interesting. We're going <laughs> after the kickers here. Joey Sly, by the way, this is a this is a revenge game for Joey Sly. Texans going up against the Carolina Panthers. So let's get off on the right foot. Thursday night football again. Uh, the Panthers taking on the Houston Texans. Let's jump right into the main slate. The Chargers at the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs are currently six and a half point favorites with a 54 and a half point total. All of these odds come via Caesars Sportsbook. Injuries to monitor. The Chargers have three important defensive pieces in Joey Bosa, Derwin James, and Chris Harris, who are currently questionable. And then on the Kansas City side of things, we have two defensive linemen, Derek Nottie and Chris Jones, questionable for them. Uh, quarterbacks in this game, obviously Patrick Mahomes, the second highest priced quarterback on both sides, DraftKings and FanDuel. Justin Herbert is the seventh highest priced quarterback on DraftKings, the ninth highest on FanDuel. Uh, looking at the running backs, I do think that both are in play on DraftKings. We spoke a little bit about Austin Eckler the other day. Actually, both of these guys. Eckler's at 7,200. Clyde edwards Elair is $4,800 on DraftKings. And again, it sounds like they are just begging you to play Clyde edwards Elair in this spot. So, Sia, you'll get the first word here. This is a massive game. It's an important one. Chargers, Chiefs, divisional matchup. Uh, how are you looking at attacking this game? I mean, I, I love the stack. It's a little cost prohibitive to, to really get going with this stack, but I've certainly already stacked some lineups with Mahomes in either Tyreek Hill or Travis Kelsey. I'll probably be borrowing Mike's advice in terms of if I had to choose between the two, because we talked about this on Tuesday, of course, um, I'd probably take Kelsey and, and punt on Hill. But just to be clear, I'm going to have some Hill too. Now, we only had three catches on four targets, just a handful of yards last week. I definitely think that's going to rebound. Obviously, he was a focal point in terms of taking him out of the game with respect to how the Ravens approached it. But honestly, I think even if he's a focal point with the Chargers, I, I see him getting loose um, quite often here. So I like both of those guys. I think McCole Hardman is an interesting sort of punt-ish play. I believe against the Ravens, he had nine targets, five catches, 55 yards. He, he's the type of guy that, you know, I've always, you know, I've kind of ridiculed him a little bit from a route running standpoint, but he could absolutely get loose. And, and I see him, you know, meeting value here in, in a lot of different scenarios. So um, that's pretty much all on the Kansas City side. And all, as far as Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the only way I would be comfortable playing with him is if I'm bought into the narrative that, well, Andy Reid's going to try to get him back on track because he looks kind of dreadful. 3.3 yards per carry. He has three targets on the entire year. That's two weeks, three targets. That's just not a good look. So I don't mind playing him at 4,800, but it's not something I'm like super excited about. On the other side, I will have a lot of Austin Eckler. I think that's pretty good value at 7,200. Remember, he had nine catches just last week 
So that that's pretty good because you know he's going to get probably between 15 and 20 touches in this game when you combine the receptions and the uh, and the carries. I like Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. I'll probably just kind of juggle the, you know the both of them. Interestingly, Mike Williams has more targets than Keenan Allen. By the end of you know week three, that'll probably flip flop. Of course, I might have a couple shares of Jared Cook. So that's kind of what I'm looking at in this game. Mike, I know that you are a little bit more optimistic on Clyde edwards Eler in this spot. See, you mentioned the three targets that he has on the season. All three of those came in week one. And you watch the Chiefs. They just love to pass the ball. And it's kind of the way that the NFL is trending. I mean, the smarter teams know that analytically, it makes more sense to pass than it does to run. That's why you see teams like the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs passing the ball uh, as much as they do. I, I think there's some sneaky value here. McCole Hardman is 3,900 in this game. He went from 69% of the snaps in week one to 78% of the snaps in week two. He also had eight targets in that game against the Baltimore Ravens. And obviously, I will have a Patrick Mahomes stack in GBP. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get up to it in cash, but I really like stacking Herbert and Mike Williams in this spot too. Mike Williams currently projecting under 10% ownership this week, and he leads the team in target share. He's been awesome through the first two weeks of the season. At 6,400, I'm pretty interested in Mike Williams. So, Mike, what do you think about this, this game overall? I mean, there's a lot going on. There is some value. There's, I think the running backs are in play. Obviously, we want to stack both sides of this game wherever we can. Uh, what are you thinking? How are you going to do it? Yeah, I think this, I mean, this game's definitely in play from several different angles. Uh, Clyde edwards Elair is probably, I hate to say it, but probably my favorite play in the game um, just because of the price point and the ownership level. So like to be clear on this at 4,800, I know that the first two games haven't been pretty, but in this offense for a running back that's going to be on the field as often as he is, if he had landed in the end zone once, whether it was a handoff from a yard out, he past hadn't lost that fumble frankly we're talking about a guy that is the absolute mega chalk of the slate that should be 25 percent owned right if this guy had landed in the end zone once this season even with the lines that he had if you just add a touchdown to his box score this year without any additional usage his ownership would be at least five to ten percent higher in this spot I think we're getting a discount on it. I'm currently projecting him around 11%. I think that number should be closer to 19 to 20% at this price point because we've kind of talked about it a little bit. You're kind of strapped for value here on this slate so far at this moment. I think he's one of the better sources. It's obviously one of the better game environments. So I like him a lot. You mentioned Michael Hardman. Love him as well. I think that this is a spot where Kansas City coming off the loss, just like they were coming off the loss against Cleveland, when they came off the loss of the Super Bowl, they're coming off the loss here. I think they try to set the tone. Guess what? They get to play at home again. I'm going to have it stacked up to the point where, again, some of you might be a little shy from doing this because of the Cowboys last week. But I think there's a small chance in cash games that I have Patrick Mahomes, Clyde edwards helaire Michael Hardman, and Travis Kelsey in the same lineup. Um, for sure, we'll have three of them. There's a possibility that I have all of them and I'm stacking the entire team uh, in that spot. I love them at home here. I love this game environment, as you've mentioned. On the other side, I will be playing some Jared Cook. May have a couple double tight end lineups, although I don't typically recommend doing it unless it's going to be a scenario where you're playing Travis Kelsey, who is like a wide receiver number one, especially in this game environment. And then I will be off of Mike Williams for the most part and on Keenan Allen. I, I like Keenan Allen a lot in this spot. I think that in order to do that, you're going to have to fade some of the Rams, most likely probably Cooper cup to make it work, but Don't do it. considering, Don't do it, <laughs> considering do the it. matchup, it's one that I think that I'm probably going to do based on the projected ownership that I'm looking at. Uh, if he's going to be the highest owned player on the slate at over 20%, uh, that is the time that I would be most interested in fading. Austin Eckler, again, I will just reiterate, at 7,200, he's projecting at 8% ownership as of now. It's something that I'm very interested in. Nine receptions on nine targets last week. Looks like he got that usage back that we were expecting now that he is getting closer to 100% healthy. Let's move on to the Cardinals at the Jaguars. The Cardinals are currently 7.5-point favorites with a 52-point total, and the Cardinals are averaging 36 points per game through their first two games of the season. And injuries to monitor for the Diamondbacks, uh, the Diamondbacks, man, you know, I was just watching, I was just listening to, to Diamondbacks Braves radio because I've got like a few head to head matchups going on right now that are very important. So shout out to Charlie Morton, the Cardinals 
uh, injuries that we need to monitor here. Linebacker Devon Kennard, uh, offensive lineman Kelvin Beecham, and wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins, questionable. And according to ESPN, uh, Hopkins dealing with a rib injury was not present for the open portion of Thursday's practice and is expected to go down as a non-participant on the Cardinals' official report. For the Jaguars, tight end James O'Shaughnessy goes to the IR. Center Brandon Linder and cornerbacks Trey Herndon and C.J. Henderson are questionable. Obviously, Kyler is playing out of his mind right now, and he's averaging 36.3 DK points per game, uh, but he is 8,300 on DraftKings, 9K on FanDuel, so that is a it's a very high price. Uh, it is very prohibitive, but we know what Kyler Murray can do. Uh, Hopkins is questionable, which I mentioned, and he's the second highest priced wide receiver on both sites. Rondell Moore, 5K on DraftKings. Uh, Christian Kirk, 5,400. AJ Green is 45. Uh, we know that Rondell Moore played great last week, snaps, and his uh, routes were way up in this game. See, what do you think about the Cardinals side of things? The Jaguars, it's just outside of Marvin Jones, who is to me a great value at 4,900. It's really just hard for me to get excited given the way that Trevor Lawrence is playing right now. Yeah, I mean, first of all, hello Kyler yet again. I'll, I'll go I'll go 3 weeks in a row on this guy. I, you know, I'm not in love with the price, but it is what it is. It's it's very well deserved in his case. The interesting thing here is, you know, D-Hop's injury status, I'm sure he's going to play on Sunday. I'm not super worried about that, but I think we learned last week that you don't have to stack Kyler with DeAndre Hopkins. And you know, we have four or five receivers if you include the tight end too who's now starting to get some targets. There's four or five receivers here that he can throw to. And last week he was on D-Hop early and then he was on Rondell Moore late. So I think Rondell Moore, you know, interestingly, I don't know what ownership you all are looking at, but the, the last ownership I checked, his his roster percentage was pretty low, which I find very interesting because he seems to be one of the better values on the slate. So at 5K, I think Rondell Moore is good. I think if you wanted to get really sneaky, especially if Rondell Moore's ownership percentage starts to creep up a little bit, I think Christian Kirk can get behind this defense really quite easily. So yes, of course, Rondell Moore can, but Christian Kirk is also the deep threat for Arizona. So I, I think that's kind of a sneaky uh, pivot, especially since Kirk is more expensive than Rondell Moore. Um, outside of that, on the on the Cardinal side, I think Max Williams is interesting. I'm not expecting seven targets like he had last week, but if he gets three or four targets and somehow lands in the end zone, he's definitely paying off his value there. So uh, I don't think I'll be on Chase Edmonds. I think he's a little too expensive. And uh, beyond that, the Jags, I agree with you, Marvin Jones. Uh, I think DJ Shark is interesting because most people will be on Marvin Jones and you only have to pay 400 more for DJ Shark. So I'll be on Marvin Jones, but I'll have some shares of DJ as well. Yep. Marvin Jones right now is projecting for, let's see what the ownership is looking like, 9%. So we're approaching that 10% range. Rondell Moore, which you mentioned, is uh, currently at 4% based on Mike's ownership projections at this point in the week. So yeah, that's definitely interesting at, at 5K, obviously playing that slot wide receiver role for the Arizona Cardinals here. Mike, what are we doing here with this game? Obviously, uh, we, Marvin Jones has been the go-to guy for the Jacksonville Jaguars to this point. 24% target share. He has three red zone targets. He scored in each of the first two weeks. I'm interested there, but uh, Trevor Lawrence, according to PFF, he has the most uncatchable passes in the NFL, so it's hard for me to get excited about anyone else. And, I mean, there is a chance that the Cardinals just kind of, all right, they sco score early and then just kind of run away with this game. I don't know how competitive it's going to be. Yeah, no, I definitely think it has the potential to get ugly. Um, you're right on. Marvin Jones is still viable as long as we're getting him 10% or less because um, he's going to be an important bring back if you're looking to really play Kyler and kind of stack him with a pass catcher. Uh, I'll most likely be underweight on this game. However, if I do end up with an Arizona stack, I actually like Chase Edmonds once again. Uh, 5700 the price point is kind of middling now to the point where it's not the elite value in the elite real competitive game environment that we had when he was 4800 uh, His ownership's going to tank to the point where you're looking at a pass catching running back that has a lot of upside at single digit ownership, something I'm very much interested in. He's already put up double digit performances in both of the first two weeks. So I think you can get away with playing Edmonds. You can get away with playing Rondell Moore. Uh, probably going to sit out on DeAndre Hopkins only because of that Kansas City environment overall. And then I, I do think that there are a couple other really key spots. It's not going to stun me, though, if DeAndre comes out here and has that three touchdown game in this one and they just absolutely roll. Uh, but at this point, I'm going to avoid it. And I think Chase Edmonds is my favorite one-off tournament play in the game. See, you mentioned uh, Max Williams. I will just point out his salary is 
uh, very cheap at 3,200. So if you are looking for a punt tight end, the Jaguars have struggled against the position and Max Williams was more involved last week. The Ravens at the Lions. Baltimore is eight, uh, Baltimore are eight point favorites here with a 50 point total on the injury front. So Thursday start off weird because Lamar Jackson misses practice and originally Adam Schefter is reporting it's because he hurt his hip when he flipped into the end zone, which is hilarious. But then it turned out that it was actually a stomach bug that he was dealing with. So cross your fingers. Hopefully Lamar Jackson is good to go. But uh, also they have offensive lineman Ronnie Stanley, safety Deshaun Elliott, nose tackle Brandon Williams, defensive end Derek Wolf, uh, cornerback Tavon Young and wide receiver Marquise Hollywood Brown uh, currently questionable at this point. Brown was limited with an ankle injury on Wednesday. I haven't seen uh, what he did on Thursday yet. For the Lions, Tyrell Williams plays on the IR. Uh, linebacker Trey Flowers, defensive end Michael Brockers, wide receiver Khalif Raymond, and running back DeAndre Swift are all listed as questionable. Uh, Swift was limited Wednesday with a groin, but I think he should be good to go. Obviously, they played Monday Night Football, so I think he'll be all right. Uh, Lamar Jackson, 7,800. On DraftKings coming off that monster week two against the Chiefs, he put up 37 DraftKings points. Now at the Lions, who just gave up four passing touchdowns to Aaron Rodgers. Sia, how would you rank those top three quarterbacks that we've already talked about? Uh, Kyler at 8,300, Mahomes at 82, Lamar at 78. Based on how likely you are to play them at their current cost. Yeah, in terms of how likely I am to play them, if we're, if we're going to frame it in that context, it's probably Lamar because he's a little cheaper and I just love that he's he's probably going to be able to do it with his legs and his arm. I mean, if we look at, for example, stacking him with Marquise Brown, Marquise Brown has been really good. 30% target share, but 16 targets through two games. I don't think we expected that from, from Lamar to, to Marquise Brown. I think he's getting, you know, we, we talked about when the Ravens drafted Rashad Bateman, hey, he's going to try to hit these outside threats a little bit more. Well, Rashad Bateman got injured, and I think all that work is really concentrated on Marquise Brown. Uh, 182 yards, two touchdowns so far. Sammy Watkins is also getting a lot of work, but he's not getting the red zone work that Marquise Brown is, and he certainly doesn't have the big playability right now at this phase of his career uh, versus a Marquise Brown. So I like the stack of Lamar and Marquise here. I think Andrews is interesting. Clearly, his target share has kind of dwindled a little bit, but I expect that to rebound at some point. But yeah, give me Lamar in let's stack him with Marquise and then the question is who do you bring him back with you can bring him back of course with the target monster TJ Hawkinson DeAndre Swift even though he's a running back I think that's an interesting bring back because we know he's going to catch a lot of passes particularly in garbage time and then Quintez Cephas if we want to ride that train again you know it's one of those things you don't really want to chase points when the end of the rainbow is a guy named Quintez Cephas but he's only 3,900 I believe if I remember correctly yeah 3,900 on DraftKings so I think that's an interesting option. He, he's certainly an athletic guy that can just get it done with one catch, frankly. Yeah, Hollywood Brown, you, you bring it up. Uh, his consistency is um, its pretty surprising to this point. He has at least six receptions, 69 yards, and a touchdown in each of his first two games. And what I found interesting was that his slot route percentage has basically doubled this year. So they're moving him around the formation. They're making it uh, a, a key point to get him the ball, and specifically in the red zone, which you mentioned he leads the team with three red zone targets. Uh, Mark Andrews has been a disappointment to this point in the season. He is 5K here in this spot, uh, mostly because he has a 19% target share, and Sammy Watkins has kind of you know eat, eaten into that, ate into that. I should probably learn how to talk. But uh, Sammy Watkins at 28% target share on the season. So... Uh, look, if I'm looking at a tight end in this game, it's going to be Hawkinson for 200 more dollars just based on how much work he's getting. But yeah, I do agree that that Swift is pretty sneaky as well. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think Sia nailed it. I, I like Lamar. I'd be fine playing Lamar. Uh, you could stack him with Hollywood Brown if you want to. If you're going to stack him with Hollywood Brown, I would run it back with Hawkinson on the other side. If not, I think it's fine to just play Lamar. Um, but I, I do like Hawkinson in this game as well. Cephas is fine in a tournament. If you really think the game can be a little more competitive, then it, we might tend to think it will be. And I actually am in that camp that thinks that the Ravens could have a little bit of a letdown spot and let this one be a little more competitive. Not unsimilar to what the San Francisco 49ers did against this team. So look out for that. If you think that is within the range of outcomes, then yes, I think you should play Hawkinson. You should play um, Lamar. I don't have any interest in Mark Andrews. I know it's getting to the point where it looks like a good buy low opportunity. The problem with it is, is there's value at the position. You've got Hawkinson with a massive ceiling now, frankly. You've got Travis Kelsey with a massive ceiling on the slate. 
and really not terribly difficult to get to Travis Kelsey. So I think that I'm going to wait and see. I might miss out on a huge Mark Andrews game, but if I'm going to do that, it's going to be on this full slate where I don't think it's going to matter all that much. Uh, but he needs to prove it before I'm going to invest. The Colts at the Titans. The Titans are currently five point favorites with a 48 point total here. And for the Colts injury wise, no Carson Wentz on Thursday. He's dealing with both of his ankles are currently sprained. Offensive lineman Braden Smith, wide receivers Paris Campbell, and Zach Pascal are questionable. And then for the Titans, their center Ben Jones, tight end Anthony Ferkser, linebackers Bud Dupree and Jayon Brown are questionable. A.J. Brown was limited on Wednesday, but that's been pretty consistent for him uh, so far this season. Derrick Henry is 8600 on DraftKings. He is 9 k on FanDuel. He is the highest price running back on both sites on the main slate. He went for a 50-burger last week. Most interesting stat for me regarding him is that he has 10 targets through two games, which might be a new wrinkle in the offense of OC Todd Downing, who is first-year OC there in Tennessee now that Arthur Smith is gone. Um, my guess is that the Titans are playing with a lead in this one, maybe even a huge lead. And uh, Derrick Henry tends to go off in like these ultra-competitive games where, oddly enough, even games where they're way behind like 14 21 points they just continue to feed him and, and maybe it's because defenses are expecting the pass but th that's really when derrick henry has like these monster games so i don't know how competitive this game is going to be if carson wentz doesn't play and it's obviously a huge price tag what do you think on derrick henry see ya yeah, I don't think I'm gonna play. I'm gonna pay for Derrick Henry here. I honestly think this is a really good spot for Ryan Tannehill, AJ Brown, and Julio Jones. The Indy defense is is kind of okay on the front end. The back end is is pretty bad. And and I think especially when we look at what happened, let's just say last week, Tannehill got a touchdown taken away from him. Julio Jones also on on the back end of that touchdown. AJ Brown had a lot of drops. I think Tannehill, like what we see right now is not what we're going to see over the next few games. And I think he's in a really good spot to spread it around a little bit to his receivers and actually rack up. You know, I kind of wanted to stack this game, but, but and I, I'm curious as to your or Mike's opinion here. I really didn't know who to bring it back with because Jacob Eason, if he's the starter, is such a wild card. I think Pittman would be the obvious bring back because he's such a big monster target that even – a young quarterback like Jacob Eason, I think he would be like the primary receiving target. But um, I think this is a very interesting, possibly contrarian stack here with Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely going to be contrarian. I, I don't know who you would bring it back. Let's find out what Mike, what he thinks. Uh, Pittman, 5,500, coming off that big game, eight receptions, 123 yards on 12 targets. I do think that if Paris Campbell, one of Paris Campbell or Pascal are out, Jack Doyle ran 91 percent of the routes uh he ran around on 91 percent of Carson Wentz dropbacks last week and that was without Paris Campbell so he's only 3400 yeah it could be a target for someone like Jacob Eason just trying to get the ball out of his hands so Mike what do you think about uh what do you think about this game oh uh, yeah it's I mean we got to know who's playing quarterback before we can really jump in and dissect it too much is it drastically impacts ownership on really a lot of players uh and Derrick Henry I think Henry's ownership will be a little too high um, after that big recent game. I do agree with you that you want him in a competitive game, especially if you're looking for the added wrinkle of catching passes. I don't see them throwing him the ball much if they're winning the game, frankly. So I do agree with Sia that this is a great spot for A.J. Brown, um, a great spot for A.J. Brown to get right. He's been largely disappointing so far in, in this season. So I think this is a great spot for him. I think it's a huge breakout game for him. As far as who I bring it back with, I think as of right now, with the information that I have, the best play in this game is going to be a single digit or 1% owned Naeem Hines. Uh, I think that that's probably where I'm most interested. I know that I'm already locking up you know, Travis Kelsey in the tight end spot. I've already locked up some of the wide receivers that we want to target. We've got some value there. Uh, I already told you I'm not paying up for Derrick Henry. I am paying up for Patrick Mahomes. So the next logical spot is probably going to be to stay down at running back, get all the points at wide receiver, all the points at tight end and quarterback, and then look for these backs that can catch passes out of the backfield. Naeem Hines fits the bill, especially if they're trailing here. They're not going to run Jonathan Taylor maximum usage if they're trailing in this game, um, you know, in a hurry up offense. This is what Naeem Hines is essentially built for. So I like him. I don't know if I'm going to give him away as our contrarian play later in the show, potentially, uh, but I do like Naeem Hines. The big caveat there is obviously need to know who's playing quarterback. And with that, if Carson Wentz is out, the Tennessee Titans DST is 2,400 
on DraftKings. So going up against Jacob Eason, even though the Titans defense has looked pretty bad to this point, I, I would be uh, interested in using them against Jacob Eason. Yeah, and, and let me just add, too, that for those of you that don't know, I mean, it's it's not just that Naeem Hines is in their negative game script. I mean, he's getting a snap share that's close to Jonathan Taylor, like through two weeks. So again, with the type of game script that we're talking about here, Tennessee's favored by five and a half. It really does make sense, whether it's Wentz or Jacob Eason, that Naheem Hines would be a big-time safety blanket when you're down 7, 10, 13 points. So I didn't even think of Naheem Hines. I, I absolutely love that call as a cheap value option. All right, let's move on to the Falcons at the Giants. The Giants are three-point favorites with a 47.5-point total injuries for the Falcons. Their cornerback, A.J. Terrell, and wide receiver, Russell Gage, are both questionable. And then on the Giants side of things, we have... Saquon Barkley and Kenny Galladay were both, ex quote, extremely limited at Thursday's practice. I think Saquon's going to be just fine. This is how they're handling him. Kenny Galladay's dealing with a hip, and he has a history of a hip injury, so I don't really feel good about Kenny Galladay's status for this week. And then quarterback Logan Ryan and tight end Evan Ingram are questionable as well. Someone that's popping for me, and, and it, like this just it feels weird to say because one of our one something we kept hit, hitting on in August was fading the Giants early in the season and Daniel Jones has played very well to this point so it's weird for me to say but he is 5,800 on DraftKings has at least 22 fantasy points in each game Atlanta has given up eight passing touchdowns and 62 rushing yards to Jalen Hurts in the first two weeks of the season so I, I'm I'm interested in Daniel Jones he's gonna run and I'm interested in his top target in Sterling Shepard at 5,900. Uh, he has at least seven plus, uh, seven or more receptions in four straight games, a 28% target share. See, am I crazy for being interested in Daniel Jones and Sterling Shepard? You're talking to the guy that on our second show ever, I was like, I really like Sterling Shepard. And it was out of nowhere. There was no context. And you were like, Sterling Shepard, what are you talking about? I love that. I think that's great. I, I think I think this is a very interesting game to stack. It's a 47 and a half point total. It certainly could go over. It should be a competitive game. I think I think you listen, Daniel Jones is not high on my list, but he's also 5,800. So you stack him, especially if Galladay is out. I mean, I think Darius Slayton might be a nice punt that's in play there too, but Sterling Shepard certainly is going to get the targets. He always does. So yeah, Daniel Jones, uh, I mean, I think most people are going to be taking the Saquon route here. So, and that's very understandable. I think you said it on Tuesday that his snap share went from 48% to 84% week one to week two. But if you wanted to get really tricky and go Daniel Jones and Slayton and, and do a, you know, a stack here and bring it back with Calvin Ridley, who has over 50% of Atlanta's air yards through two weeks, or a Kyle Pitts, certainly makes sense. Yeah, Saquon Barkley currently projecting for 11% of the ownership. He's 6,500. Those snaps were way up in week two, and now he's coming off 10 days rest in look in an okay matchup the falcons are actually better in the in the front seven uh compared to their secondary so i think saquon barkley is going to be a pretty popular play uh the falcons you mentioned calvin ridley is 7k and the giants defense james bradbury normally very good a strong top corner but he just got destroyed by terry McC mclaurin last week uh, and then kyle pitts is 4900 i personally am not very interested in either of the falcons running backs Mike, Daniel Jones, Sterling Shepard, Saquon, any Falcons love? What are we thinking? Uh, I mean, if you like Sterling Shepard, Daniel Jones, and Calvin Ridley, I think the thing that I would say there is it's okay to exclude Daniel Jones still and just play Sterling Shepard and Calvin Ridley together. Um, the thing about Daniel Jones that we need to be careful about, yes, the rushing yards are great. The rushing attempts are great. Those scores are slightly inflated because while the rushing yards – we can predict the rushing touchdowns are a little more difficult to predict, especially with a healthy Saquon Barkley and some of those options in the red zone. So what I would do personally and what I, what I have done, but what I would recommend to some of the users there when it's not someone like Lamar or Mahomes or Russell Wilson or Kyler Murray, go remove the touchdowns from the box score, the rushing touchdowns from Daniel Jones. If you're still satisfied with it, which I think you probably still are, I think it's fine to play him, but it's not someone, you know, yes, we can project him to run and rack up rushing yards. I don't think he's someone that we're going to consistently think is going to rush and score touchdowns running like some of these other guys that I mentioned will. Uh, so one thing I like to do with players like that is I do like to remove that rushing touchdown. Just like I talked about earlier, frankly, adding a touchdown to Clyde Edwards, Hilaire's box score, very real outcome, very real thing that could have happened. 
Uh, it's very, very real that Daniel Jones has those big rushing games without actually landing in the end zone. So I will not be playing Daniel Jones. I think it's okay. And I think he has obviously demonstrated the upside that he has. Um, but I do have some interest in Sterling Shepard. I do have some interest in Calvin Ridley in a tournament, all depending upon can I get Ridley at single digits? If I can, I think he's a fantastic pivot away from some of the Rams and these Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receivers. All right, let's move on to the Browns hosting the Bears. The Browns are currently seven and a half point favorites with a 45 and a half point total in this one on the injury front for the Bears. Defensive lineman Eddie Goldman and defensive lineman Akeem Hicks. Safety to Sean Gibson, wide receiver Darnell Mooney are questionable. And of course, Andy Dalton is out in this game. And then on the Cleveland side of things, we do have uh, Jarvis Landry, who went on the IR. Four of their five starting offensive linemen are currently questionable, with Jadavion Clowney and Odell Beckham questionable as well. We spoke about it a little bit on Tuesday's podcast, Mike. Justin Fields is a huge wild card here. He's 5,200 on DraftKings. He's 6,500 on FanDuel. He rushed for 31 yards last week, filling in for Andy Dalton. So he played about half of that game and he ran a ton in the preseason. He had over 1100 rushing yards uh, and 19 rushing touchdowns in three seasons in college as well. And with that pass rush of the Browns coming at him, I mean, we could see a big rushing day here for fields. It's just everything else. I don't know how well he's going to pass or, you know, if there's going to be turnovers involved. So Mike, what do you think about Justin Fields at that low price of 5,200? I don't hate it. Uh, the issue is, is I'm not going to be handcuffing him with a receiver at all. Um, so I, if you want to play him by himself, I think it's okay. If you want to bet on that rushing upside, he's someone who, unlike Daniel Jones, I think that I would feel more comfortable about him landing in the end zone. If he does have a big day rushing, uh, I would expect him to run the ball a lot in the red zone in this offense. Um, overall, I think this Cleveland team is still very good. I think this game I don't think it turns into a massive shootout. If it does, I'll be obviously very wrong, and Justin Fields will have an absolutely monster fantasy day. But uh, I think that they keep the clock moving a little bit. I think Cleveland keeps the clock moving, pounding the ball with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Uh, I can pretty confidently say that in like my primary lineups, so like on a main slate and playing five lineups, I will not have any exposure to this game. Yeah, I was just about to piggyback off of that. I'm just not really interested here. Nick Chubb, love the talent. He's 7,600. Kareem Hunt, 5,600. They're both very talented running backs, but the problem is they eat into each other's production. David Montgomery, I do think is sneaky. He's 6,100, and his snaps went up in week two. He played 80% of the snaps. He had 23 touches. Cleveland has been tough on the run game, but... With a rookie quarterback in there, I think they might want to lean on the run, and obviously having a mobile quarterback might open up rushing lanes a little bit more for David Montgomery. See ya. Uh, I am. It sounds like neither Mike and I are, are very interested in this game. What do you think? I like your point about David Montgomery, uh, especially if his ownership is super low. I think Nick Chubb is interesting because I don't think people are going to want to pay up for Nick Chubb. And it's just one of those things where – I think Justin Fields might have a decent fantasy day, but I don't think he's going to have a great football day. And so I think you're looking at some potential short fields for Nick Chubb. He hasn't really gotten started yet this year. His snap share is a little alarming relative to Kareem Hunt, but I could see him having a couple touchdowns in this game because I think I think Cleveland is going to create a couple short fields for him. And I, I just think he's not going to be, I don't think his ownership is going to be anywhere near what it was last week. Odell Beckham is 5,300. Sounds like he is going to return. I don't know if he's going to play a full complement of snaps. So uh, I'm just, again, I'm not very excited about anyone else in this game, maybe outside of David Montgomery. The Washington football team are at the Buffalo Bills, and the Bills are seven and a half point favorites with a 45 and a half point total. Injuries to monitor for Washington defensive end Matthew Ioannidis is questionable on the Buffalo side of things. We have safety Micah Hyde. Defensive tackle star Lotulale and wide receiver Gabriel Davis questionable as well. And there's a chance that this is our first meh weather game of the season. It looks like 56 degrees, some light rain in the forecast, 12 mile per hour winds. It's nothing that's completely awful, but just keep that in mind when making your lineups. Josh Allen all the way down to 7K on DraftKings. He's 8K on FanDuel, has not played well this year. 56% completion percentage, 5.3 yards per attempt, but... He has had some tougher matchups here against the Steelers and the Dolphins. Stefan Diggs checks in at 7,600. He is the third priced wide receiver on both sites and apparently has the fourth best wide receiver cornerback matchup this week, according to Pro Football Focus. 
Mike, we've got some weather here, a lower-ish total, not very exciting, but as a result, you might get Allen and Stefan Diggs at lower ownership. So what do you think? Yeah, you might get them at lower ownership. I'm very interested to see where Diggs comes in and Allen come in relative to someone like Russell Wilson, DK Metcalf. Uh, I think I'll, I'll take the lower own combo there, and I'm actually projecting that to be uh, the Seattle side at this point, which is kind of interesting. Um, if I were to play those guys, I have an excellent bring back. And if it's not a bring back, it's someone much like Naeem Hines that I'm very interested in using, frankly, in all formats this week. And that's JD McKissick. Uh, I think that this football team is not going to be winning this game. They're going to be trailing a lot in this game. Very similar there. They're not going to run Antonio Gibson out there every single play. They're going to, you're going to see a workload similar to what we saw on that. Uh, I believe it was Thursday night football game. Um, where he got in there, had a lot of usage, was targeted six times, five catches, uh, did get a rushing touchdown in that game. But I do like J.D. McKissick, 5,200. I think he's kind of in that no man's land. You're not going to really play him over Clyde edwards Elair at the price just because of the usage. Um, but I think this is a fantastic spot for him, for Naeem Hines. Uh, if you can't tell, that's kind of the direction that I'm looking at going uh, at running back this week. Uh, on the... Washington football side of things outside of JD McKissick. We have Terry McLaurin at 6,900 and coming off that massive game against the giants and James Bradbury, but likely to see Tredavious white here on the other side uh, with the Buffalo bills, Antonio Gibson, pretty low price here at 5,900 on DraftKings. However, I don't know that he's 100% healthy. They're saying that he is, he was dealing with the shoulder last week. And as a result, we saw McKissick get more work, uh, but his targets went from five in week one, just, to two in week two. So obviously uh, that's not very exciting uh, on a site like DraftKings where it's one point PPR. Uh, See, what do you think? Uh, you looking at anyone here on the Washington football side of things? Well, McKissick is really interesting, especially because Taylor Heineke is the starting quarterback. I, I think they have a chemistry that perhaps Ryan Fitzpatrick and JD McKissick did not have because Ryan Fitzpatrick was not here last year. I should say here. That's this is my team. So he wasn't in Washington uh, last year. Uh, you know, I, I don't like Gibson, to your point. I do like Terry McLaurin because why not? I think Adam Humphreys is kind of sneaky here. And I, I like a stack here. You know, on Tuesday, I mentioned a very contrarian stack with Taylor Heineke and McLaurin. But honestly, the stack that I think is really good here is Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. And then you bring it back with Terry McLaurin. Listen, we just talked about Daniel Jones, what, 10 minutes ago? And just how he's how he's been playing through two weeks. Look what he did against Washington. I mean, first of all, the Giants should have won that game, if we're being honest here. He ran for almost 100 yards. He passed for a handful of yards. And frankly, he probably should have passed for way more yards. There were some drops. There were some throws that were, you know, almost got there that, that just that just didn't come to fruition. But Josh Allen's got to be looking at that blueprint, knowing that Daniel Jones is basically the poor man's Josh Allen. I think in spite of the pass rush, we know on the back end, Washington's got some holes. And I think Josh Allen might find himself running and passing quite a bit in this game. So I, I think even though this is only a 40, 45 and a half point total, I think it's a really interesting game to stack. Daniel Jones, the really, I mean, we're talking like really poor man's Josh Allen. Like this yes. guy, I mean, he's, you know, he's, yeah, he's poor. It's it's, it's yes. uh, <laughs> I was trying to think of like an analogy, and it's, it's I was like, all right, let me just get away from this because I'm going to say something <laughs> bad, and then all right, forget <laughs> it. Uh, but Stephon Diggs and Terry McLaurin, yeah, I, two alpha wide receivers in in the NFL, so it's a pretty obvious stack and, and bring back there if you want to roll with that. They both have 28 percent of their team's targets on the season. Before we hit the break, want to remind everyone that our fantasy football today DFS contest on DraftKings is currently live. You can find the link. In the podcast and YouTube description, 150 entries, single entry, $5, top 15 gets paid out. So that's obviously top 10% of the contest. If you want to play against Sia, Mike, and myself, feel free to join in there. We'll hit a break when we return. We've got a few more early games to get to, and then we'll hit the afternoon slate next on Fantasy Football Today DFS. All right, so let's move over to the Bengals at the Steelers. The Steelers are three-point favorites, 43.5 point total here, and a lot of injuries in this game. T. Higgins missed both Wednesday and Thursday practice with a shoulder injury. Cornerback Trey Waynes and defensive tackle Larry Ogunjobi are questionable for the Bengals as well. On the Steelers' side of things, Ben Roethlisberger, Deontay Johnson, T.J. Watt, Joe Hayden, all currently questionable. So again, a lot up in the air right now in this game. We know that there are two... Very talented running backs here. Najee Harris is 6,600. Joe Mixon checking in at a very favorable $6,300 on DraftKings this week. Both running backs play a ton of snaps for their respective teams. 
I think the real interest kind of checks in if we lose one or both of Deontay Johnson or T. Higgins in this game, assuming that Ben Roethlisberger plays, then you're getting some value in Juju at 6K, Chase Claypool at 5,800, Jamar Chase at 5,400, and then Tyler Boyd at 4,700. I do think that is contingent on players being out. Uh, Sia, what do you think of that statement? Yeah, I like your Juju call. I think Juju, listen, like if DeAndre Johnson isn't playing, that's 30% of the targets that are just going to be redistributed. And, and I think a lot of those, I think a disproportionate share are going to go to Juju because we know Chase Claypool is more of a deep shot guy. Of course, Freyer Muth is there. Um, Ebron, if he's healthy. And then, you know, James Washington does get on the field. So he'll get a couple of those. But I think Juju will get peppered with a ton of targets without Deontay. So I actually love the value there. As far as the receivers, yeah, if Higgins is out, I think both Boyd and Chase are obviously in play. I don't necessarily like one better than the other. I mean, Chase is going to have more of the air yards, but I think Tyler Boyd's going to have more of the reliable targets. And honestly, the way this Pittsburgh front four will get after, I should say front seven, will get after the terrible offensive line and Joe Burrow, I think those short area targets might be a little bit more important. So I think Tyler Boyd might be the play there at 4,700. Yep, and he had a big game last week, seven receptions for 73 yards, a nice bounce back following his disappoint, uh, disappointing week one. I do think the Bengals' defense is in play. If uh, if Ben is, honestly, even if Ben plays, they're probably in play at 2,100 just because they're so cheap. And the Bengals' defense has actually played pretty well, so give credit where it is due. Mike, we have some... Big name running backs in this spot, uh, some potential value at wide receiver opening up. What do you think, Steelers and Bengals? Yeah, I think the best play here, there's two good, really good plays in this game. And it might shock some of you because I was, you know, I had a little Najee Harris, but not a lot last week. And he got there with that late touchdown. I was actually very encouraged by the five targets, uh, 43 yards receiving from Najee Harris. I actually think that uh, if Deontay is out, I think that helps Najee Harris a lot. I think they lean on him even more. I think his involvement in the passing game goes up because Ben doesn't have that reliable weapon that's going to be able to get open. Uh, at this point in his career, Ben's going to be looking to get rid of the ball quickly. I, I like Najee Harris if uh, Deontay Harris is, or if Deontay Johnson is out. I love Najee Harris. Um, on the other side, Tyler Boyd is clearly the answer to me. I love what I saw last week. I love those numbers. Uh, and I agree with you that the shorter targets are going to be key really for both teams in this game. Um, so I'm pretty firmly, even if Higgins plays, I'm off Higgins. Uh, I'm off chase in this game. I have interest in Tyler Boyd either way. And I have interest in Najee Harris either way. All right, let's move on to the Saints at the Patriots. The Patriots are three-point favorites, 42.5-point total. Injuries for New Orleans. We have cornerback Marshawn Lattimore and center Eric McCoy are questionable. And then for the Patriots, linebacker Matthew Judon, offensive lineman Trent Brown, and running back Damian Harris are questionable as well. Alvin Kamara, 8,200, the third highest-priced running back on the slate. I think this game is going to be really slow back and forth here. Uh, just not a lot of excitement. It's a lower point total. Maybe that means you get you get Kamara at lower ownership, uh, and obviously he is a super talented player, but it's hard for me to get excited about Alvin Kamara or, or really any New Orleans Saints in this spot. James White, I think, is standing out to me on the Patriots side of things. You mentioned a lot of pass-catching running backs already today, Mike. He is 4,900, and without Ramondre Stevenson active last week, James White went all the way up to 50% of the snaps. He had 11 touches, six of those are receptions, and Mac Jones is just dumping the ball off. He is not pushing the ball down the field at all so far this season. So any interest in, the, in this game at all, uh, I guess, including James White at 4,900? Yeah, I mean, it's James White at 4,900. Uh, that's my theme. That's my price point. Um, I'm looking for running backs between basically 4,600 and $5,700 this week. Uh, maybe get up to Najee Harris in that uh, isolated range, but otherwise, it's going to be a lot of value running backs. So White's the only one I would play, but outside of that. And I think he's a fine standalone play because I think he gets there through volume really no matter what the game script is. Um, so I, yeah, that's my only interest in this game. Frankly, I'm not touching anyone on the Saints. All right. See you. Well, <laughs> that's not a very exciting game. Uh, I, I respect the Saints defense and they're 3,100. So that's not a tough price to, to pay for a defense, but I just don't know that, you know, the Patriots are going to ask Mac Jones to pass the ball that much. And, and that's kind of what we need when we're looking at a defense. 
Yeah, and I think the game plan for New Orleans is going to be similar to that of Mac Jones' game plan. So I think if you wanted to make an argument for Alvin Kamara, it's not a very good one, but it would be more of a contrarian one because I expect him to be like 5% owned or less. It, you know, And if he gets a lot of those short area passes, which he typically does, I mean, we know how much of a turnover machine Jameis was last week. I think they're going to keep this game a little close to the best. So I think it's going to be a lot of Kamara. I'm probably not playing much of him, but I think if you wanted to make an argument for a contrarian high-end running back, you could make one for Kamara. And I absolutely agree. The only other guy I would potentially be interested in here is James White at 4,900. All right, let's get into these afternoon games and some really big totals as well. The Seahawks at the Vikings. Seahawks, one and a half point favorites, 55 and a half point total. One of three games with a total of 50 over 54 points this week. Uh, for the Seahawks, Rashad Penny is doubtful. Offensive lineman Brandon Shell and wide receiver Freddie Swain are questionable. For the Vikings, Dalvin Cook. Did not practice again on Thursday, dealing with an ankle injury. Defensive end Everson Griffin. Uh, we had cornerbacks Brashad Bre uh, Breland, Patrick Peterson, linebackers Anthony Barr, and Eric Kendricks, all questionable. So uh, the defense for the Vikings a little bit beat up right now. Let's see what the injury report looks like come Friday. Uh, Dalvin Cook was probably my favorite of the highest priced running backs, but he was everybody else's too. Apparently 20% ownership projection uh, checks in as the highest owned running back on the slate. And then Chris Carson, I think it's just kind of like rinse and repeat. We talk about Carson every week. He's 6,400 right in that similar price range. Again, he's played 70% of the offensive snaps on the season, but also pretty popular Carson checking in 14% projected ownership. And we have some other options in that price range. Joe Mixon, Najee Harris. So uh, Mike, the running backs here, big names, Dalvin Cook, Chris Carson, any interest? Uh, I'm I'm not going to be playing Dalvin Cook personally, but uh, as I've laid out throughout the entire show, I'm not going to have room for it uh, just because I, I'm playing Patrick Mahomes, I'm playing Travis Kelsey, and the rest of the spins are going to happen at the wide receiver position. One of them will be in this game on the other side. So uh, I'm not going to be playing any Dalvin Cook. Um, you know, you've got the injury tag, you've got the highest – projected own running back and that projected ownership is approaching 20 percent uh and it probably will exceed 20 percent all pretty easy fades for me at this point in the way that i play daily fantasy here so i, th I think it's a really easy fade as far as carson it's really going to depend on what i do with Najee harris um i might actually be on the other side of that this week with Najee harris over carson um but that, that's where i'm at on the running backs when it comes to potentially stacking this game, obviously we have a ton of awesome pass catchers. Tyler Lockett, 7,400. DK Metcalf, 7,300. You have Gerald Everett as a potential punt tight end at 3K. On the Minnesota side of things, we have Justin Jefferson at 7,200. Adam Thielen at 67. And KJ Osborne down at 35. Uh, Mike, if you are looking to stack this game, how would you do it? Uh, DK Metcalf's my favorite wide receiver in this game. He's going to be a pretty core piece of my lineups this week. I like, I love him a lot, really. Uh, on the other side, Osborne, I'm not going to ignore that value. I do. We've started to see the price come up on Rondell Moore. Still a fine value at 5K. At 3,500 here, just because of the upside that he's already shown us and not necessarily a massive volume, but he still is on the field. We're still looking at a very competitive game, one where I think that they should be trailing, frankly. Uh, I'm not going to ignore the $3,500 price tag. That price tag at a bare minimum should be 4400 just absolute bare minimum for his role in the game environment. So I don't care about the ownership on that one. I'm very happy to see that it's not approaching 15%. I can very easily live with that at 10 to 12. KJ Osborne, 19% target share on the season. I did not like that his snaps went from 81% in week one to 59% in week two, but he's still... Uh, obviously had a great game and had that really long touchdown against the Arizona Cardinals. See, if you are looking to stack this game, how would you do it? I'd probably go the, the Russell Wilson side of it. I think Kirk Cousins is interesting. Kirk Cousins has been really efficient. Five touchdowns, zero interceptions, not, nothing to uh, balk at there. But Russell Wilson with DK Metcalf, I, I think that's solid. You bring it back with Justin Jefferson. I can tell you I'm going to play a lot of Justin Jefferson here. I am a little discouraged about KJ Osborne's role as it relates to the targets for Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. But to your point, those targets have gone down a little bit. So while I agree, KJ Osborne, I will be playing and – He's getting enough targets and he's running enough routes for me to justify playing him at 3,500. I think we're about to see a Justin Jefferson breakout game. And, you know, last week, I believe it was he caught six balls, 10 targets. Like it's starting it's starting to get to a point, especially in a total of 56. Like let's let's re, let's like think about this a little bit. 
KJ Osborne and Justin Jefferson and Dalvin Cook could potentially get there for you because of this point total. So I think Justin Jefferson's probably my favorite guy here. I'm not going to be on Dalvin Cook. I'm not going to be on Chris Carson. I was not impressed with him last week. And, and frankly, you know, I know Travis Homer is also coming in on third down. So it's not all exclusively Chris Carson's work. Um, so yeah, if I'm going to stack it, give me Russ and DK and I'm going to bring it back with Russell, uh, with, uh, Justin Jefferson and hopefully just like Mike, I can get cheap elsewhere and maybe still get a piece of that Kansas city game. Uh, it's pretty scary to ever consider fading someone like Justin Jefferson, but I do think if I was looking at a Kirk cousin stack, you're getting Adam Thielen right now. It looks like 7% ownership, the lowest ownership of the three pass catchers, the main pass catchers for the Vikings. And we know that Kirk Cousins loves Adam Thielen. So if you wanted to put something together with Cousins, Osborne, Thielen, bring it back with Metcalf or Lockett, or if you think this game is ultra competitive, bring it back with both. I think that is going to be pretty unique uh, in GPPs this week. The Bucks at the Rams. The Bucks are one and a half point favorites, and the total is up at 55 and a half points for Tampa Bay. Antonio Brown tested positive for COVID, but there is still a slight chance that he plays because According to reports before the season, the Bucs were 100% vaccinated. And if he tests negative twice uh, before, I guess it would have to happen before Saturday, before they kind of like pack up and go over to, to LA, uh, then there is a chance that he could play, but it's it's very slim at this point. Jason Pierre-Paul is also questionable. And on the Rams side, Daryl Henderson did not practice on Wednesday. I will see if he practiced on Thursday, but he is questionable with a rib injury. And linebacker Leonard Floyd is questionable as well. All right, here we are again. It's Cooper Cup, 6,800 projected for the highest ownership at 21%. Sounds familiar. That's That was the case last week. Robert Woods, $5,700 uh, on DraftKings at 14% ownership. Tyler Higby is 4K coming off that disappointing week two. I think Van Jefferson is very interesting as a value play at $3,400. Uh, $3, on the other side, if there's no Antonio Brown, Chris Godwin at $6,100 is going to be very popular, but I think for good reason. Uh, Mike Evans is $6,300. Rob Gronkowski snaps, routes, targets all up this year, scoring touchdowns left and right. He is $5,500. Mike, if you are stacking this game, you mentioned that you like Stafford the other day on Tuesday's podcast. Uh, is that the route that you're going down? I think it's the interesting route to go down. I think the most popular way to get exposure to this game is probably not going to be to stack the quarterbacks. I think it's going to be just playing Cooper Cup and Chris Godwin on their own. I think that's what the field's going to largely do, uh, which I think is fine. But I think that if you really want to attack it that way, I think you should get just a little different, get a little overweight to the situation. And that's going to be with Stafford paired with Cooper Cup and maybe Robert Woods both with the bring back of Chris Godwin. I think that's a super interesting way. If you don't want to go with um, Robert Woods, I think that Cooper Cup and Van Jefferson together are fine. Kind of take out that KJ Osborne play unless you want to play both of them. But I think it's a good way to get different from KJ Osborne, frankly. Um, as of right now, I, I'm going to have Chris Goblin in the lineup. Undecided on Cooper Cup. The Cooper. This might sound really crazy to a lot of people, but the decision between Cooper Cup and DK Metcalf is really difficult for me. Uh, they're very similarly priced. They have a lot of upside, obviously. Um, the discount that I'm getting in terms of projected ownership for taking DK Metcalf versus Cooper Cup is meaningful. And at this point in the day, I'm still tinkering with it. It's going to, frankly, be determined by is Antonio Brown on the field or not. Uh, that's going to sway me one way or the other because I'm going to look to get more exposure to that Rams game overall if Antonio Brown is playing. Uh, but as of right now, I'm leaning on not playing Cup, and I'll be playing Godwin, and then I'll, in the process of doing that, I'll be getting on to DK Metcalf, who we just talked about. Yeah, I think Godwin's going to be very chalky this week, assuming that Antonio Brown is out. Uh, Godwin again, 6,100. And if you're worried about Jalen Ramsey, they've already talked about, all right, they're going to move Jalen Ramsey around, and he's not just going to be on Mike Evans. But Chris Godwin has run 70% of his routes out of the slot this year, so that could be a good way for him to get away from Jalen Ramsey in this spot. Uh, see, there's a lot of pass catchers to talk about. We haven't even mentioned that if Daryl Henderson is out of this game, then we get Sony Michelle at a value at 4,900, but it also comes in a, a tougher matchup because say what you want about the, the Bucks secondary, they have struggled. They are still very, very strong against the run. 
Yeah, but I mean, at 4,900, Sonny Michelle would still get featured. And, and there's really nobody behind him. I don't think Jake Funk's going to get a ton of snaps. So I would still play him if Daryl Henderson is out. Um, obviously, I like Cup and Woods. I'll, I'll, you know, if they're both going to be popular, I'll just go ahead and take the discount on Woods and just play a chalky guy that's $1,000 less. Um, outside of that, you know, on the on the Buck side, uh, obviously, I'm not playing any of the, the running backs. I played a lot of Tom Brady last week. I have no issue playing with uh, him again in some sort of stack this week, likely with uh, Chris Godwin and, and not Mike Evans. I think Mike Evans will see way more Jalen Ramsey than uh, Chris Godwin will. So that's another reason to play Chris Godwin. And then, you know, probably no Gronk for me here. So I might stack this game a little bit with Tom Brady, Chris Godwin, and then maybe I'd run it back with Robert Woods and I'd just throw something else in there like a Van Jefferson. The the, the problem with Van Jefferson is, I mean, he's running as many, his, his snap rate is good. He's running as many routes as Robert Woods and Cup. He's just not getting targeted. And I, I hope that changes. I, I would say between Van Jefferson and KJ Osborne, I think the floor might be a little lower for Van Jefferson, but the upside to me is equal to. So I think he's an interesting play at 3,400. Uh, yeah, Van Jefferson, the snaps went way up in week two. Just Deshaun Jackson basically uh, was not used at all in that week two matchup. They had 32 dropbacks and Van Jefferson was in on all of them. So I, I thought that that was pretty encouraging for his usage. Let's quickly wrap up with uh, two more games here. Uh, Mike, what do you want to I want to, I want to mention one more thing on the Bucks. Uh, just because of the kind of builds that I'm looking at that I've talked about throughout the show, Leonard Fournette actually does project as someone that's going to be in my player pool. Uh, I like his price point at 5,000. I believe he has 11 targets in the first two games. The thing that's interesting about those two games is they were in kind of cruise control, kind of not, got more competitive than they should have. If Antonio Brown is out, this one's going to be very competitive. It might be very competitive anyway. There are a lot of sharp people that think the Rams actually take this game from them. I like that for uh, Leonard Fournette here. I like that if, again, they don't have Antonio Brown out there trying to get loose I think things could lean to more short passes. It allows them to focus on Gronk more. I think this opens up, interestingly, for Leonard Fournette. Uh, all we really need, obviously, is for him to land in the end zone with a pass or a rush down there in the red zone. But I think as far as his floor, I actually think it's relatively high in this matchup. I yeah, and uh, Frank, right. I was just going to say, uh, and you're probably about to say the same thing I am. You know, I kind of glossed over the running backs there, but when you look at the when you look at the metrics here through two weeks, I, I think the Rojo noise is truly just noise from Bruce Arians, and that's just like classic Bruce Arians. But even when you look eye test wise, I mean, Fournette looks really good out there, and he's definitely getting way more touches. So at 5K, I mean, that in a game with a 56 point total, I mean, I, that what what a great call. I think that's extreme value there. Yeah, I was just going to bring up the usage. 14% target share for Leonard Fournette is near elite for a running back. And Tampa Bay running backs have 10 red zone opportunities this season. That's carries plus targets. All 10 of them have gone to Leonard Fournette. So there is no denying his role in this offense. The Dolphins at the Raiders. The Raiders are four-point favorites with a 44-point total. Uh, Tua Tungo of Iloa will not play in this game. On the Raiders' side, Josh Jacobs, Richie Incognito, and defensive ends Carl Nassib and Yannick Ngakwe are questionable. I personally am not very excited about this game. Uh, I don't know how competitive it's going to be. If Josh Jacobs is out, Canyon Drake at 5,500. He's catching passes. Uh, obviously, Darren Waller is awesome because he gets a ton of targets, uh, but he is 7,400 and you know, that's 800 less than Travis Kelsey. So that, that cost is pretty uh, prohibitive here. Mike, any interest at all in this game? Dolphins at Raiders. Um, I'm going to use my time to crack a liquid death in this because I have no interest in this game and nothing to say about it, but we can uh, pour a little water for everyone here. Um, yeah. I have nothing on this game. I'm not playing anyone here. All right, I'm going to take a sip of my water. We're all going to drink water, and let's see you talk about his favorite players. So here, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to use my time to say, dear Miami, when you have a quarterback that you're trying to have succeed, you don't draft another receiver after already getting a receiver in free agency. You grab a world-class tackle in Penny Sewell. By the way, same message to the Cincinnati Bengals. Instead of Jamar Chase, they also could have gotten Penny Sewell. I don't know if you noticed, but Joe Burrow was always on his back at a rate more than any other quarterback in the entire league through two weeks. And same message for the New York Football Giants, who drafted Kadarius Tony in the first round and spent $80 million on Kenny Galladay when they clearly needed help with their offensive line. So this is my way of saying, I don't think, you know, this Tua narrative is really going to, to be bad for him. 
And I don't think it's his fault. You got to get the offensive linemen when they're there. And that's part of the reason I hate this game as well. All right. Very well said. Uh, I think another game that we probably hate is going to be the Jets at the Broncos. The Broncos are 10 and a half point favorites. Uh, Jameson Crowder had a setback. It sounds like he could miss uh, his third week in a row. And for the Broncos, Bradley Chubb placed on IR. Noah Fant and Tim Patrick were limited on Thursday and are both questionable. Uh, Cortland Sutton is 6K. He's coming off a massive game. I don't know how competitive this one is going to be. The Jets have actually been better against wide receivers than I was expecting. Maybe that's just, be just because teams haven't had to pass against them. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of similar situation here, Mike. Any interest in this game? I don't have any interest in it. I think the problem here is the Cortland Sutton explosion game before this. Um, I'm showing him around 10 to 12% owned. I think he's a fine play like in a vacuum, but when you add in the ownership and everything there, I won't be participating. Uh, I would need five to 6% for me to be able to be like, yes, I can play Cortland Sutton in a one-off play. Uh, I do think that the Jets can make this game more competitive than some people think, or the 11 point spread indicates. Um, but overall, yeah, I don't think I'm going to end up with anyone in this game. All right. See ya. You're up. You, you just ragged all over the, uh, those, those teams, not taking offensive linemen. Uh, the Jets tried. It's just, it's, it's not really working. So yeah, the Jets are doing it right. They they've just been plagued by a little bit of bad luck. The, the one guy I'm looking at at 3900 is Braxton Berrios, especially if Jameson Crowder, who, who appears to have aggravated an injury, is not playing. Braxton Berrios has been an absolute target monster through through two games. I think he had seven catches last week on I believe it was 11 targets. He's got 18 targets through two games. He's going to be the underneath guy that Zach Wilson is going to lean on, kind of as as a safety valve more than anything else. I, listen, it's a 41 and a half point total. There's not going to be an explosion of points here, but at 3,900, a guy who's commanding approximately nine targets per game. I can't argue with that. And I will point out the Denver defense is very uh, expensive at 4,300, but we just saw Zach Wilson throw four interceptions last week and uh, he looks, he looks pretty lost, but to be honest, most of the rookie quarterbacks do let's wrap up the week with our week three cheat sheet, our favorite value, a chalk play, a contrarian play and our favorite stack of the week. Mike, why don't you get us started? All right. I have filled this out as we have gone through the show today, and I'm actually going to make my value play Leonard Fournette. Uh, after talking through everything and after mm -hmm. looking at my numbers here, he actually projects significantly higher than I thought. And we're still, I'm running this basically hedged with Antonio Brown, about 30% chance of playing. I think that could even be high, frankly, but uh, I like Leonard as a value play. For the chalk play, I'm moving Clyde Edwards Elayer to the chalk play. I think that after this podcast, I think after everything shakes itself out over the next 48 hours, I think that that 10 to 12% that we're projecting is actually going to approach 15 to 20%. Uh, I think more people are going to get invested there. We've got some concerns with Dalvin Cook. You see that massive ownership number. You see the injury tag. Um, not knowing what's going on with the situation with Derrick Henry, I think the builds across the industry change a little bit. For the contrarian, we're also going to stick in that same range because I've already told you what I'm doing at all the other positions. It's we got we got to get the running backs right, and we're not paying up. For, so for contrarian, it's going to be Naeem Hines, J.D. McKissick. So those four running backs: Leonard Fournette, Clyde edwards helaire Naeem Hines, J.D. McKissick. I'm going to have combinations of those four that are going to hopefully all be catching passes out of the backfield and getting me enough fantasy points. And then my stack, not going to get. Uh, cute with this one. It's going to be Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey going to take the stance like I did in week one, which was a very profitable week. I'm going to be overweight to the field there all in on Kansas city at home coming off of a loss. All right. See so you're up value chalk contrarian and your favorite stack. So the value is going to be Marvin Jones who continues just to be very good and he's not being priced accordingly. He, he leads the team in, let's see, snap share, target share, red zone targets, overall targets. Last week he had six catches, 55 yards, one touchdown. So uh, I like him in a game that's probably going to get out of hand. And I, I think they're going to be peppering uh, Mar Marvin Jones, particularly in the second half. Uh, chalk play. Let's go with Saquon Barkley. Uh, I mean, listen, he plays Atlanta. Pretty, pretty soft defense. I, I know they're pretty good against the run, but they're not good against uh, pass catching running backs. They're allowing a lot of receptions through two games, as you might expect. So I think Saquon might get, done, might get it done with the carries, but I think he's also going to get it done with the receptions. As you said, Frank, 
48% snap share to 84% snap share, and now on 10 days rest. This guy is ready. These, this team is desperate at 0-2. Um, they're, they're out for blood for sure here. Contrarian play is going to be A.J. Brown. I don't, I, based on what I'm seeing, his ownership share, roster share is going to be around 5%, probably a little bit less than that. And I think he's in a really good spot this week to kind of bounce back both him and Ryan Tannehill. So um, I love what he's going to be able to do against the back end of the defense that he's going against. Uh, the stack I really like is going to be with, with approximately a 49 to 50 point total. It's 50 now. It's a Lamar Jackson with Marquise Brown and bringing it back with TJ Hawkinson. The one thing you mentioned, I think, Frank, earlier, or maybe it was Mike, you know, this is an eight point total. I actually expect this game to be a little bit more competitive. And it's mostly because golf and company on offense aren't as bad as people think. And we saw a lot of that against Green Bay. It was really just some blunders at the end when the rain started where it really kind of got out of hand. But it was a back and forth game prior to that. So I, I really think especially when you consider the Ravens being so banged up on defense. I really think they're going to be able to move the ball pretty well, and this is going to be a back-and-forth affair, and all three of those guys I think will do well. All right, and you know why the Lions have uh, been able to look okay on offense? It all comes full circle. Their offensive line is amazing. They have one of the better offensive lines in football. Value play for me, Van Jefferson at 3,400. I think it's close between him and KJ Osborne. You want to flip a coin between those two, uh, but I do love that game. I love both games, but uh, I, I like the increased usage here for Van Jefferson. He is 3,400. Chalk play for me, Chris Godwin at 6,100, projecting at uh, right over 15%. As of now, 15% ownership, but I do not expect Antonio Brown to play in that game. He's going to run routes out of the slot, obviously, and I do expect him to be one of, if not Brady's top target in that game. Contrarian play. I mentioned it earlier. David Montgomery projecting at 2%. I don't think anybody's going to be on Montgomery, but 80% of the snaps last week, 23 touches, rookie quarterback playing, making his first start. I think that they're going to want to lean on the run and maybe we even see a few dump offs to David Montgomery in that spot. And then the stack for me, I'm not going to overthink this one either. Uh, Russell Wilson to DK Metcalf. I know Tyler Lockett is a lot of people are still going to go to Tyler Lockett based on what we've seen to this point. But uh, DK Metcalf, I think, has same similar game breaking ability as Tyler Lockett. And you're probably going to get him at a little bit lower ownership. So uh, Russ to Metcalf for me. Let's wrap there for CN Mike. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Football Today DFS. We'll be back again on Tuesday where hopefully we are talking about how much money we won and we don't have back-to-back -back losers. We'll see you then.